Uh, sounds good. It's uh, six thirty. We'll open the meeting. Um, so. so it is on. You're just being recorded. You're not being broadcast. Live. Okay. So please know that we are not being broadcast live, but this is being digitally recorded. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> anyone here for open session? Yeah. Okay. You guys want to come on up or stay right there wherever you feel comfortable? Yeah, we'll stay right here. All right. Uh, we're, we're, we're here because of the logging. You know, behind behind our houses. Okay. You want to you want to state your name and your address? My name is Dave Kenny. I'm at 33 George Joy Lane. Okay. Uh, when they started stripping the trees down, I called in. I was told that it was a forestry prod project. But before I called in, I talked to the operator. The operator tells me that you know that they had a permit. Called in where? Where did you call? I called in town at uh, town hall. Okay. All right. Conservation committee told me that it was a forestry project. They gave me a, a name uh, of Mike Downing. Anyway. Okay. I tried to contact him. I wasn't able to get get through Brian here. He uh, spoke uh, spoke with him, and uh, evidently there's no permit either with the town or with the, with the state. And we were given a lot of different answers here, and it's looking more and more like a pit expansion. And we want straight answers. Sure. Uh, obviously, this is uh, well, not obviously to you, but this is new to us. I don't know, Ryan, if you have a <coughs> something you want to chime in, if you have any info. So I, I fielded uh, many questions. Yeah. Many questions about this. Um, obviously, the residents were concerns, so we did look into it. So Mike Downey, who we referenced, is the uh, Hubbardston representative for DCR's Forestry Division. So I was able to talk to Forestry Division and Mike, and then the operator uh, Anderson, who is doing the logging. Okay. Um, from what Mike was correct, Mike said there was no state permit filed. So when you get a state permit, that exempts you from local statutes, yeah. particularly from conservation. Okay. So there was no file on plan. There was a little confusion with Mike because it was a, a plan on file for a certain piece, but this particular piece that's being discussed here was, was not on file. So um, then talked to the operator. The operator said this was Monday. Operator of the machine? Anderson, yeah. Anderson, the logger. That, um, they would cease operations until the plan was filed with the state uh, because they, they wanted to avoid any uh, confusion. So apparently the plan was to submit the, per the permit in the plan, but uh, they jumped the gun hmm. on the logging. Yeah. So, so is the permit in the plan in the state's hands now? From, from what I understand, it was headed there. Okay. Uh, but Mike said, he would let me know, the residents said they'd let me know <coughs> operations kicked up again. <coughs> uh, but there would be more communication between us and Mike in terms of uh, when things were going to start officially or if plans had been filed. Have they in fact stopped? Yeah. They yeah, did. I think so. Uh, so whose fault is this? This is, so the, the let me understand again that the DC, Hubbardston's representative to DCR? So Mike covers forestry in this area. Okay, but he, so he works for... He's the state, and he's more part of this region. Yes. Okay. So, um, had Anderson contacted him to let them know, to let him know they were starting? No. No. Are you, you going to say something? He did contact Mike, but it was for a different section of property. Oh. Um, so, is this... Whose land is it that's being logged? Fletcher. It's the Fletcher Pit in one ragged building. Well, so do we, do we think this is a mistake? No. No. So I think it's definitely poor communication uh, in terms of when the, the logging is going to start. Probably would have informed everybody. But in terms of are they allowed to do it if, if they file permits and it's on their land and it's within the, the permit jurisdiction, then, then yes. The only permitting that we have there is if they were to punch out a new driveway, which they didn't, or uh, some conservation restrictions, if they don't file a state permit, and then uh, they would have to fall within the gravel permit permitting process. Through the planning board? In terms of expansion, if they don't have an existing one. But are, the, are they expanding or are they just harvesting timber? So that we don't know. Is it a clear cut? Oh, yeah. 
So this isn't a thing. No. <clears throat> so are they, I mean, what are they subject to? Are they subject to fine? We're not sure at this point. Okay. Now, is it a requirement, part of the permit requirement? Uh, is there a requirement to notify the butters, or did, do they yeah. just log in? If, if they, within 200 feet, they need to. Okay. They're about 40 feet. So the reason for submitting the plan is to make sure that none of this stuff is violated mm -hmm. so that it can just happen. <clears throat> so no one's abiding rights are violated. Or so setbacks and all that sort of stuff, right? You mentioned you thought it was there was something else other than just logging. Is that just a gut feeling or? Uh, that's what the, uh, uh, it's not a gut feeling. It, it was something that was mentioned that is possibly uh, a pit expansion and that it would fall on the state, you know, fall on the town, you know, it would be town jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was from Mike Downey, you know, because he didn't know what was going on, you know. Mm -hmm. So they filed a plan and the state exempted them, knew exactly what was going on, that, that it would continue. If they don't file a plan, they want to cut them, it does go to local regulations and they have to look at it from a conservation. But it, it sounds like they're going through that process now, yes. correct? So that would be only if they started again without this plan on file. Or yes. if the file, the plan filed did not match what was going on, what was doing, then there would yeah. be more conversations. So, so they, sorry. No, no, no. So are they, they've been, is there, is there a paper trail right now? They're, of a cease and desist sort of thing, and okay, we will cease and desist. Is that so the logger voluntarily stopped? It said that they wouldn't start again until the plan was on file. We should probably get a paper trail going here. Um, what would be the, uh, the right way to do that, I think? So if there was a need to stop them, mm -hmm. then the order would probably come from the Conservation Commission. Mm -hmm. So if they started again without a plan on file, then we wouldn't exercise the Conservation Commission's authority to review it. And try and bring everybody in to talk so that it could be communicated as to what was going on. I don't really want to wait to them to start again. You know what I mean? Well, it sounds to me, if he voluntarily stopped, it sounds to me that the permit process is under review now or the steps have been taken and he doesn't want to push any more buttons and he's waiting for the review from them with the permit. That's the way I see it. I do too. I just think that they, they might need to um, receive a scolding uh, for, for, for doing it out of order. No? Better ask, you know, it's better to ask for forgiveness type thing. You know? Was it, were all the trees, was it flagged out? Or, I mean, they just There's flags out there, yeah. Behind my house there were. Those yeah. flags he put there, so his new guy cut up to the flags and then he was gonna do up to the property lines to prevent damage to our property. That's what he told me. But there was no survey done. Well, no, I don't think they'd survey, but no. I'm, I'm sure Forrester probably, if there is a plan in the works, a Forrester must have went out there and, but there wasn't and, and marked it. They just know? walked around and hung the survey. Yeah, those flags are right on the property line. It's not like... Well, someone you know, might, might just show reference to where the property line is so they don't go any further. No, they actually approached, you know, they're taking trees 40 feet behind our, uh, our prop, property line, and I believe the state is, you know, they're supposed to stay to, uh, you know, 200 feet. I think it's even closer than that on my property, closer than 40 feet, probably 20. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know, I, I guess I would wait and see what the plan actually says. But or shows. I hear you. I agree with that. I guess, but from the standpoint of, they clearly have not gotten through the correct channels so far, right? And that's just the reality. They've done. Uh, they just sort of said, "No, we're going to go do it our way," and they get caught, and so now they're kind of going back. So I don't know. I just that, that's not a great uh, precedent to allow. Um, uh, okay. Well, I guess. I guess, does conservation have a meeting anytime soon, are they? Uh, they I know they went and visited the, the property. Uh, okay. They're speaking with the state as well. Uh, 
they're comfortable that it stopped right now from the last communication I had with them. Um, sort of agree that if it starts again, then the action needs to be taken immediately until the plan is known. If the plan is filed and it's within regulations, then that, that's the right of the property owner. Yeah, I mean, we can't but imagine it's going to start up, right? I mean, they're, they're pretty well known around here, do a lot yeah. of work around here. They're not going to want to, you know. But if they are encroaching on them right now, <clears throat> why should they be in the, excuse me, why should they they'd be able to start up again. But if, if there's a forestry plan <clears throat> and they encroach, the forester will, after any logging operation, they come out and will inspect the site. Mm -hmm. if, if they're in violation, then the state will actually find them. And I don't want to speak for Mike, but that is what was intimated to me, because he wants to see the plan and then see what was done, and then it lies mm -hmm. to, uh, to make sure that he, what he's hearing what he's seeing and what was planned is, is matching up. Okay. What's the time period on that? How much time are we talking about before you know, these people know what's going to go on? Um, I can't say, but I'll, I'll definitely keep everyone updated. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been told by the state and by this representative, Mike, who you're talking about there, mm -hmm. that he'll keep in contact with us. Because they've got some serious concerns, obviously. Yeah, yeah. What, are, what are their plans? <clears throat> what are they doing? That's what we have to find out. So I can't answer that. Um, but we'll do my best to get that information. We'll certainly, I have all of your contact information. I've been trying to communicate what I know. No, it's been, yeah, it's been. This is what I know now. Okay. The plan has been promised to be submitted, so if we see the plan, we'll communicate that. If it's I, not, I think before they start <coughs> up again, you need to know exactly what their plans are before they're allowed to start up again. If this is a pit expansion, you know, that's going to affect my crop, crop value. Right now, clearing the trees behind my house is going to affect my property value. I don't have the woods that I had before, you know? And to me, it was sick and to see those trees uh, trees drop. You know, they didn't take just one or two here and there, they took them all, you know? So there's something going on that you don't know about, that we don't know, you don't know about. And, you know, this isn't the first time he's been down this, this, this road. You know, he got caught mining a, a, a quarry without a permit out there. That was before I moved in, but I heard all about it when I moved moved in. So it's not his first time skirting the law. So I can't speak to that. Well, I understand that. would be uncomfortable that. speaking about uh, that person without advising them that that's going on in a public meeting. Mm -hmm. But certainly going to keep in contact with the biggest enforcement authority we have, which is the state forester's office. To make sure that things are being done right, and if it starts again, please let me know, and we'll take every action we can. Okay, now I have one question: If it is a pit expansion, what are what are our rights? We, do we have any any say at all? That would be a planning board issue, wouldn't it? So that would be communicated to us through this plan. That's why the plan is. So I keep saying we need the plan, um, and then it would be vetted through the permitting process, and it becomes a planning board issue. Okay. And we won't be notified. If the process is yep. done correctly, yep. it will be on the Okay. <laughs> you know, we don't want to find out when we see trucks out there hauling away trees. And it's not a great answer. It's an yeah. honest answer, though. Yep. We don't know yep. about things until we know about them. So as soon as we knew about this, we acted. But things were happening before we knew. I, I think, though, that we need to keep a close eye on it. It makes me, it's not the same thing, but it makes me think a few years back with the solar project, remember? They were cutting down trees and so forth, and they're cutting trees down there. On people's property, it took really changed the view of the uh, people's homes, and I, I wouldn't want to see that again if you can't put the trees back up. So, well, I think now that it's in the spotlight and all eyes are on it, um, I'm hoping that they go in the right direction with the proper permits mm -hmm. again. Okay, you, you anything further on this item? No, you just want to say any notification, anything you guys hear, I'd like just be you know, updated. I think you mentioned you email, right? Yeah. 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 Oh. Cool. If you all are leaving, I mean, you can say, but I just want to make sure that you guys sign in because <coughs> that way we have your information on file. Okay. 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 Um, hey, anybody have anything else for open session? No? Okay, okay. absolutely. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Awesome. Sorry thank for your. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you.
details on, on what she's put together for this year yet? So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of vendors up there. There's a lot of food vendors. Um, I don't think she's going to have smash a car, but you know there's going to be a lot of things going on. Okay. So hopefully the weather's nicer than, than last time and um, should be a good turnout. I'm going to be there too. Oh, wow. So I will be there. I will be actually having a vendor booth What? Scrapbooks. So it's, it's, yeah, I've been doing that in my spare time, so it's going to be pretty exciting. Oh, exciting, I'm sure. All day long, don't worry. All day long. <laughs> Sounded like a good idea at the time, so now I'm in it. Stop by my booth. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> item three, the, the stretch energy code. Yeah, so we are joined by uh, Jim Barry. Jim, if you want to come up. Sure. Jim is the Western Mass Regional Coordinator, helping us understand uh, effort to become a green community in that grant process. So part of that process, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but I'll just set it up, is uh, adopting the stretch energy code. There's an article uh, supported by, by this board on the town meeting warrant. And we wanted just to give some information to this board and the public about what that would entail. Anytime you change uh, building code, it obviously impacts the town. Okay. Where are you, where are you out of? Uh, so I'm Jim Berry. I work in, I live in Belchertown, so I'm the Western Mass Regional Coordinator. As you probably know, the DEP has four different regions in the state. Um, Kelly Brown is generally your regional coordinator. She's not well today, so I'm filling me for her. I just lived down the road with these. Um, in 2008, when the Green Communities Act was created, I was a member of the Board of Selectmen in Belchertown. Um, I was not a state employee, and I was <coughs> struggling with budget season for a fifth or sixth year in a row and we had a bunch of schools that had those uh, heater ventilators underneath the windows that we were replacing a few every year because that's all we could afford to do every year so um, I heard about this green community grant program that said if you become a green community there's money available for energy efficiency projects so I went and listened to someone uh, make a presentation of the, what the whole process was I said to the board well I'll volunteer to go learn some more about it in case we want to do it so I went to multiple meetings to learn about the Green Communities program and figured out we could probably actually do it in Belcher Town and maybe that could help Grandy and maybe Palmer. Um, and so they offered me a job to go and help explain to other boards of selectmen since it's, A, I think it's a, 
it blew my mind that it's a great program, and B, I, uh, being a selectman, I probably can speak the same language these people speak, which is money, 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 money. Um, so uh, the, the front page here is the Green Communities Division. It's relatively new. It was created with the Green Communities Act. The Green Communities Act was a great big um, law that created all sorts of stuff, primarily around solar and renewable energy credits and um, net metering. But there was a section within the Green Communities Act that was pertained only to municipalities. So there's money set aside for municipalities, but only if you jump through some hoops. So um, the Green Communities Division was created. We are the hub for municipalities for all things energy related. So if you have any questions about renewable energy, um, energy efficiency, you're not sure where to get good information from, your regional coordinator is your liaison to Boston. I don't know all the answers, but I know people who know the answers, so mm -hmm. um, that's basically what we do for a living. Um, the Green News Designation Grant Program is the primary reason I get invited to go to talk to people because there's money involved. We have $20 million a year that we can offer as grants to municipalities throughout the state. Um, the money is not part of the standard state budget, so if the governor needs more money for state police, he can't just take it from our to, uh, budgeting. It comes, it's built into the state legislation that the reg regional greenhouse gas initiative option proceeds and ACP funds go into the Green Community Program, which we then distribute. And I can tell you about that in great length if you want. It's almost but, like community preservation a little bit. It's similar, but the money, so the, the basic money, if you pay an electric bill, you're paying into these funds already. Yeah. If you're a utility company, which you're not, but utility companies that have trouble meeting their renewable energy portfolio, so they're required to have a certain percentage of their electrons be renewable energy every year. Mm -hmm. And that percentage goes up every year. And they have to buy green energy from big solar farms or from wind farms or, or someplace to ensure that the energy is green. And if they have trouble buying and proving that, they have to make alternative compliance payments, kind of a, a, a um, slap on the wrist for them for not doing their job. That attorney, alternative compliance payments goes into our bucket as part of the money we can spend. Is that why something like Grid and Eversource, like a few years ago, bought up a bunch of properties and were actually installing solars themselves? Well, so a few years ago, the law changed. <coughs> Many years ago, Grid owned uh, energy production plants and they owned the distribution lines. And a number of years ago, they said, we're going to break up these huge monopolies and say, you can do one or the other. You can either make electricity and sell it, or you can have the lines and distribute it. So they weren't allowed to uh, own their own power plants. But a few years ago, they were allowed to have re their own renewable energy. So yes, Grid and Eversource did install large solar fields for two reasons. One of which, they don't have to buy electricity from somebody else. And it makes their, their input into the grid greener so they can avoid alternative compliance payments. So yes, that was part of the incentive to get them to do things. Yes, sir. So um, when we first started in 2000, uh, I was hired in 2009. To, to, the program started in 2008. In 2009, there was no green communities. We started going out and talking about it. We figured we did a dozen or so. We knew Cambridge and Amherst would do it, but who else would want to do it, right? Well, it turns out that it's, it's not as difficult as people had first thought, and that there's money out there. So um, every October, we accept new applications from new municipalities. <coughs> and last October, we got 30 new green ones. That's what the highlight green, those are the new folks. But there's 240 throughout the whole state that have jumped through all five hoops to become a green community. Um, why do people do it? They do it because there's money involved. Um, so some of your neighbors who have been green communities for a while have received money. Um, it's based on a uh, formula. If you become a green community, you get a minimum of $125,000, and then there's a, dollars, there's a certain dollar amount per population. So small towns get a little bit less than big towns, which get less than great big cities. So many of your neighboring towns have, almost everybody, everybody gets a minimum of 125. Lately we've been seeing 100. I have a lot of small towns in my region. Mm -hmm. um, 70%, 70 percent, 70, 70 of the towns of my 100 have less than 1,000 people. So we, we get 125, 127, $130,000, that's, yeah. that's a great start. Um, after you spend that initial grant on energy efficiency projects, might be LED lighting, might be more uh, insulation, it might be new heating systems, once you spend that initial grant, you're eligible to apply for another grant and another grant. Once a year, you're allowed to apply for up to $250,000. So 
Barry, for instance, and Peter Shen, they had been in the program for a while. They got an initial grant, and they got additional monies over time. So if we go to the next page, I think you'll see. That you, so the guess based on the math is that if you became a green community, you'd start off with $130,000. And then once it was all spent, um, then you can apply for up to 250 for the following year. And once that is spent, often small towns take more than a year to do it. Big cities, they can assign someone in the, in the to development office or the, here, go, here, go do this grant and it get, gets done quick. A lot of my small towns, um, it's difficult to, to get it done. Um, often it's an energy committee of volunteers that do it. Maybe it's someone in the town hall and two or three volunteers that get involved in doing this. We also provide funds for your regional planning agency to help you become a green community and help you with procurement and babysitting the funding. So in the last five years, we've, we've expanded our effort to help other regional planning agencies. I think you're CMRPC, Central Mass? MRPC. MRPC. So we offer that money to help you folks um, because we're finding a lot of small towns are getting <clears throat> not just left in the dirt, but left behind. So we offer them money and they come and uh, uh, they know the program. You know how they get you, get you through the hoops? So that's what, where you would start is about $130,000. MRPC is assisting us with this process. Yep. yep. They're already on your, under contract with you. Yep. So there's five hoops you have to jump through to become a green community. I can talk about all five of them until uh, the cows come home. You probably don't want to. My goal tonight was to talk about the fifth one primarily, which is a stretch code. Well, there are five that you have to meet. Um, a couple re refer to zoning and being business friendly. And a couple refer to how you as a town use energy. But, um, and again, if, if you want, I can spend time on that. I was, I, no, no, carry on as you were. Okay. And then if you want, we can come back to think sure. on how much that was. Now you're sick of listening to me. Sure. So the next slide we get is. I just wanted to mention sure. before we scare everyone, yeah, yeah. purchasing fuel efficient vehicles, there's exceptions for public safety vehicles, et cetera. So this yes, is sir. talking about vehicles where that would make sense. Okay. You're not going to get a, you know, like a Prius plow truck. <laughs> so, um, the fifth criteria said that you ha we have to do something to make sure that all new construction reduces life cycle costs for energy. And uh, how the heck are we going to do that? So, it turns out that the stretch code is the way we can do that. And 260 towns have adopted the stretch code so far. So, you notice that th this number is bigger than the number of green communities because what happens is town meeting season, which we're into, People vote yes on the stretch code, but they don't become a green community until later in October, November, December. So this this number is almost always bigger than the other number mm -hmm. because in, in, in the case that there's at least 20 towns that have gone through at least one of these steps and are in, are in the pipeline. So again, your neighbors are here. So we're going to talk about criteria five in a little bit more detail. The, the five criteria are all in the legislation that created the program. So it's not like the legislator said. We have a screen community program, go invent something. They said, we're going to have a green community program, and here's the bones of it. There's five hoops you've got to jump to, and they're explicitly listed. And the fifth one says, all new residential construction and new commercial and industrial real estate construction must minimize, to the extent feasible, the life cycle cost of the facility by utilizing energy efficiency, water conservation, other renewable alternative energy technologies. So when that, when that was read in the folks in Boston, <coughs> how the hell are you going to enforce that you, a new home is energy efficient. Turns out that the only real way you can enforce what goes on in construction, whether it's homes or buildings, is through the building code. It also turns out that the building code evolves over time. Every few years, it changes. So the building code today is far more energy efficient than it was years ago. Years ago, you could build a house with two by fours, a little bit of insulation, and pretty decent windows, and amen, go with God. Now the building code has evolved, so you can't do that. It's far more explicit and far more stingy. And in 2009, they were looking forward to the next version of the standard building code. They knew about what it was going to include, so they built building regulations. Let's go back. Does the next slide tell me this? Oh, shit. No, we'll back, back up again. Um, turned out that they knew what the next version of building code was going to be, so they said, we're going to offer an optional appendix to the standard building code we're going to call it a stretch code because it's a bit of a stretch from the current building code. And if you voluntarily adopt the stretch version of the next version of the building code, so you're a bit ahead of the game, we know that it will be more energy efficient than the previous one because we already know what it looks like. So if you want to meet criteria five and you have another way to meet it, we're happy to listen to it. But in the 10 years we've been doing it, 
and one's found another way to ensure. The stretch code has been the way. And it's always been a little bit ahead of the curve of where the building code is going. And so it's a bit of a stretch to get there. So, so we, we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but <coughs> yeah, so that's we, fine. we've, I don't know how many years ago it was. Do you remember? We looked into this. Well, well not look sure. into it. I don't know the right way to exactly say it, but I remember. You heard about it and heard, and heard this stretch code is crazy. We're not doing this great. Well, that, that was the discussion. Was like, yeah, look, it's going to cost me 10 grand more to build my house. Why would yeah. we want to adopt something that, like that? That's exactly right. So, um, are we going to get to it? That's fine. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, the, sh the good news is, not only did the stretch code evolve in 2009 and 2012 and 2015, um, today, the stretch code only applies to brand new residential construction and new commercial construction that's over 100,000 square feet. I don't suspect that you're having a lot of new commercial construction in town that's over 100,000 square feet, so we don't have to worry about that. But additions, renovations, and repairs to any building, whether it's residential or municipal or existing commercial, those renovations are exempt from the building, from the stretch code. And that wasn't it, the case. That wasn't the case early on. Because early on in 2009, um, they were still looking forward and the regular code had not caught up much. So they were still trying to make it, how do we make sure more stuff is done? Um, I think the next slide tells us where, what happened. Yeah. So, the, as the code evolved, the, the two, in 2012, <coughs> the standard code evolved so you couldn't use 2 by 6 construction anymore. I'm sorry, two by four construction in R13. You have to use two by six. So the standard building construction for a new house without the stretch code was almost as, as expensive as a stretch code. It's not that the stretch code got cheaper, it's just that the new whole homes got more expensive. Because they had to do more insulation, they had to do more better windows and better heating systems. Um, so what we say today, in 2019, is the stretch code is no longer much of a stretch. The 2015 code, so again, it was 2009, 2012, about every three years it changes. And it takes a while for Massachusetts to adopt it. So the 2015 code was adopted in 2017, <coughs> it takes a while. And that code um, said that although there's two paths you can use today in your town to build, if you do a stretch code, you can only use one path. So I'm going to explain what that's talking about. There's a prescriptive path and a performance path. If you want to build a new house, say, in your town, and you're a builder, you can tell the building inspector how you're going to do it and which code, which piece of the path of the code you're going to follow for energy efficiency. We're not talking about uh, anything else except the energy efficiency pieces of it. The prescriptive path is like going to a doctor and get a prescriptive and they says, take this medicine and you take it and you just do what you're told. You go to rehab and you do what you're told. You follow the prescription. And the building code has mostly been a prescription. Which, so it says you need R19 in the walls, R49 in the ceiling, the building inspector comes out with his checklist, checks off. If you follow the prescription, you pass. There's always been an optional path called a performance path where you have a little bit of leeway in how you build it as long as as a whole it's energy efficient. So we're going to measure the performance of health as a whole, not just as a prescription, and that way you have it, we're going to measure that it really is energy efficient. <clears throat> so is that like by a third party? Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah. We're going to talk about so exactly who that is and how much it's going to cost. You're, you're, you're remembering how this all went. Yep, yeah, you're exactly right. So if you adopt a stretch code, the prescriptive path no longer becomes an option in your town. The builder has to follow the performance path. So the, why would you want to follow the performance path? Just doing it to prescription might not be a great job. So small... Uh, Failures, small lacks of perfection in insulation or air sealing could lead to large energy losses. So the performance path has always has been encouraged. I like to tell people, I know none of you are old enough to remember in the 70s when we had a severe energy crisis, you could not buy gasoline except Monday, Wednesday, and Friday if you had an odd number plate, and Tuesday and Thursday you'd have an even number plate. We had some serious problems importing oil from people who didn't like us, and so the government was put in lots of programs to encourage people to use less oil. Energy Star for Homes grew out of that concern. The Energy Star program, which you're probably familiar with appliances, etc., is a federal program to encourage people to get stuff that's more energy efficient. There's an Energy Star for Homes program in existence that guarantees that homes are energy efficient, 
There's a process called the Energy Star for Homes, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to measure using that same process that already existed to see if a home really is um, energy efficient. And again, I wanted to mention what are the key features that we're talking about. We're not talking about um, <coughs> fire alarms. We're talking about insulation, doors, windows, mechanicals, building tightness, duct tightness. Those are the pieces that we're talking about. Those are the only things that are impacted by the stretch code here, are those things that relate to energy. So the process includes an outside expert. So a builder has an electrical subcontractor, a plumbing subcontractor, and now a home energy rating services expert subcontractor, H-E-R-S. What's, that, what's the typical cost for that, do you know? Um, yeah, that I do. <laughs> a couple thousand bucks. <laughs> the short story is a couple thousand bucks, but we're going to get to the real details okay. in about five more slides. No, that's okay. No, 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 these are fair questions. These are questions that I absolutely expect. If you don't ask them, I'm going to answer them anyway. So it starts with, um, and this is, the thing that blew my mind is, this is the Energy Star for Homes process, the HERS process. I was surprised that when I heard that the state had this new program, that they didn't invent this brand new process, that they piggybacked on an existing process. Because quite often, you know, they invent some new thing. In this. But this, this program, the HERS program, the Energy Star program, has been around in the United States for a long time. 12% of the houses in 2010 in Massachusetts were Energy Star homes because that's what a lot of people are leaning towards. Now there's more and more homes being done energy efficient because that's what the young people are buying because they're smarter than we are. So the process begins with hiring someone and doing computer modeling on the plan. So the first thing you do is you go to a computer, you go to a HERS expert with your plans and you, you sit in front of the computer he says, how big a house you make? Uh, 2,000 square feet. Um, one story or two stories? Well, it's two stories. What kind, what kind of a, um, air sealing are you do on the outside? Well, we're going to be using Tyvek all around the outside. How much insulation are you using? We're using R45 in the walls and R65 in the ceilings. Okay. And the, the person is plugging it into a computer and comparing it to the way we used to build houses and seeing if this is, in fact, more energy efficient than it used to be. And so there's a computer modeling process it ensures that the house has designed is going to meet the requirements. And a piece of paper falls out of the computer that you take to the building official before you get a building permit. Here's the house we're going to build, and here's the energy components of it that we, you can expect to find as we build it. In addition, there's some in-process inspection. Oh, what did you do? Sorry. <laughs> you broke it again. It's okay, I usually do that. You can go to the next slide if you want. It's here. It's here. So, Look, back up. This one was a red box around it. There we go. I thought I did that. I think you were. So there's zoom went away, though. The what? The zoom. It's small. Yeah, it's small. So there's an, in addition to the computer modeling, there's in process inspection. So just as today, the building inspector. Start over. Go to. Okay, I can go home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the building inspector today um, does a lot of your inspections for insulation already. In a stretch code environment or in an energy star environment, because you can build stretch code energy star homes in your town already because it's an option. If you become a stretch code, it becomes an option. It doesn't become an option anymore. So the HERS person not only is involved in the modeling, but is involved in the inspection process. In some towns, the building inspector goes there at the same time just to see what's going on because they want to know what's going on, they're really doing it right. But eventually some builders, so in my town, in Belchertown, we've had it for seven or eight years, the building inspector says, he doesn't always go to all the inspections anymore because he knows the builders in town, he knows what they're doing, and he knows we're going to test it on the way out so he doesn't have to go and look at every piece of the insulation. Your building inspector is looking at all the insulation because he's responsible to make sure that it's done well. The current code says you must have air sealing on the whole perimeter. You must have this home airtight as of 2014. It didn't used to be that way. And when it first came out that way, a lot of builders said, you're going to cost me $7,000, $8,000 more to do this, not just air sealing, not just this Tyvek around the outside, but either clock or seal every one of those seams, which costs more money. That's not required in your town with or without the stretch code. And so the, the PERS inspector and or the building inspector is going to be involved in looking at duct tightness, we're going to look at um, insulation. Is it done well? We're going to look at the blower door test, which also 
blew a lot of people's minds when it was first invented. This gentleman in the picture is doing a blower door test. Notice that the walls are painted and the floors are all done. If you fail this, you're out of luck. What they do is they close the doors and windows, they put the house under pressure, and they measure how much air is going out the door. So now they know how much air is leaking somewhere. And so that number tells us how airtight is it to make sure that it, A, it's not too airtight, and B, it's at least tight enough. So that's what this whole process is about. Um, today, in your town, if there is ducts involved, the duct tightness has to be tested. <coughs> and today, in your town, without the stretch code, you have to have a blower door test to get a final COO. You don't have to have the modeling, you don't have some of the other inspections, but the builder has to hire someone to do a, a, a blower door test. That went into effect in 2014. In, 20, in 2017, they said, wait a minute, you can't hire your brother-in-law with a blower door to do the blower door test. You've got to have someone who, who's certified. So now, in your town, a new house has to have a first person involved already. It's not as extensive as with the stretch code, but slowly but surely, the standard building code start to catch up with the stretch code until the price difference between the two got smaller and smaller. So the next so uh, yeah, the next slide is what is this first score? What is the number? What, what, what are we aiming for? Um, so we're going to measure heating and cooling and water heating for the lighting and appliances. That's what we're measuring. And we start with, I, mean, I talked about a modeling process. We start with a new home built in 2006 code gets a score of 100. And every time we do something better with a little better insulation, the thermometer drops. If we do slightly better windows, the thermometer drops. If we do a better heating system, the thermometer drops. And the goal is to get to 55, which would mean it would be 45% more efficient than a house built just to the base of 2006 code. So all new homes being built currently are much more efficient than they used to be by regulation. And by a stretch code, we can actually measure it and see that it's at least 45% uh, better. So that's, a, that's how that works. And I think we're getting into the money. So there's two slides here, uh, a summary page and a detail page. This is a summary page. We're going to talk about how much more it's going to cost to build to a stretch code and what that means. But I want to get to the, the detail page, the next page, which is where that number comes from. So uh, with this administration, they said regulations that are, before we do new regulations, we do a cost-benefit analysis of all regulations. So we hired a firm from Connecticut to look at the stretch code and the building processes and what it's going to cost to see what is the actual building, what is the cost of it. And when we did this in 2009, it was $7,000, $8,000, $9,000 more. Once the code changed again, we're looking at a typical, the typical size new house in Massachusetts is 2,550 square feet. Um, it's single family home. We're going to look at one that's heated with propane. I'll show you oil in a minute. Um, but we find that propane is easier to be more energy efficient because the burners are more efficient. So this is a typical home heated by propane. These are the features we're going to briefly talk about. Here's what would happen if you just built it to current building code. The HER score is already 66. It's already better than we used to do. But we need to get to 55, so here's some things we're going to change in the cost of them to get there. The first thing that's going to change is you have to hire this person to do more than just a blower door test. That person has to be involved in the modeling and the inspection and the blower door test. So we're going to add an extra $500 to the cost of this house for this HERS person to be involved in the process. Windows in the base code have to be a 0.3 in terms of U value. This builder went with slightly better windows to get that thermometer down because a better window saves energy, and that was an extra $500 in this instance. Heating system, the standard propane heater is about 92% efficient. They went with a 96% efficient propane heater. So again, that dropped that thermometer down. We're trying to get it down to 55. And that's $300 more to get a better heating system. Similarly with cooling, a better cooling system was $400 more. Domestic hot water, we spent a lot of money on making hot water, and it's hard to make hot water. Which it, so they went with a tankless propane domestic hot water heater, and that was $700 more than typical. And they tightened up the duct leakage to outside. So if you have duct work in the house, you're going to make sure that it doesn't leak to the outside by insulating it better than code requirements. 
and that was two hundred dollars. So the whole thing cost two thousand six hundred dollars more for this house to meet the stretch code than the builder would do, build without the stretch code. Notice that we did not change the air tightness. Air infiltration was to, um, measured by that blower door test. The air tightness, air infiltration in 2014 got tighter in a standard building code. The stretch code does not require it to be more tight. In 2009, this was not the case. In 2009, this freaked a lot of people out. Three air changes per hour, you're gonna make this air tight. We're gonna have mildew, we have mold, sick house syndrome, what, what are you people, crazy? Well, it turns out that you can build a house that is airtight, that still does breathe, and does not have mold or mildew. And in fact, any new house built in your town since 2014 has met this airtightness requirement. Uh, we did not add more insulation, but a builder could um, adjust some of these and not adjust some of these. So they have an option of how they get that thermometer down by maybe putting in more insulation and don't do the propane tank either. So anyway, in this instance, it was a $2,600 more expense to build this house. We go back to the summary page. So there's a $2,600 extra cost. I mentioned Energy Star programs out there. There's rebates and incentives from Mass Save. This home, because it got to a score, is based on a score, received a $1,600 rebate on, to build this house. So now we're at $1,000. It costs us $1,000 more to build this house in the stretch code. And if the builder, I don't know how you builders work in, in this town, but if you had a $250,000 house and it cost another $1,000, would it be $251,000? Uh, my conversation with builders is they don't price houses based on the total cost of what the house is. They base that on what can I sell it for based on where it is. But if the $1,000 was just added to the price of the house and it was a 10% down payment, that's another 100 bucks. If the 1,000 bucks was added to the mortgage, that's $77 a year on a 20-year mortgage. So it's going to cost the homeowner maybe 100 bucks a year on the mortgage to pay for this. But there's $475 in savings on energy based on doing it to the stretch code, which means there's a positive cash flow year one, year two, year three, year four. So in 2009, 2010, these numbers were a lot bigger. And these numbers were hard to, a lot of people said, I'm not sure I want to do that yet. I'm not sure the house is going to be sick. I'm not, so we're going to just wait. A lot of towns said, we're not going to go down this path yet. We'll wait and see what happens. Maybe, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. It turns out that a lot of towns have done it successfully. Builders have not gone out of business. Realtors have not gone out of business. And it's, it's gone along. So um, we have another one. You're going to the next one. Because in my town, so almost everybody uses oil heat. Oh, I'm looking for one that says oil heat here. There we go. So with the oil heat example, it's more money <coughs> to meet the stretch code. And if you go to the next page, I'll show you where that comes from. Again, we added more money for the hers person and the windows. But this, the heating system, a standard heating system in oil is 83% efficient. That's not really great. And so if you start looking at that compared to the 2006 heating systems, it's not, it's, not lowering your, it's not lowering that thermostat because we've had not great oil furnaces for a long time. So this person wanted to stay with oil. They found a 96% efficient oil furnace. They are out there. You don't get them at the big box. So that's a special order. And it costs a lot of money. So these other things didn't change much if you go back to the summary. So we have a much higher cost to build an oil heated home in the stretch code. We have the same kind of rebates, so the extra cost is higher. The mortgage is a little bit more per year, but the savings are substantial because now you're saving a lot more oil, so the savings still offset the cost. So if you want to build with oil, you can. It's a bit more upfront cost, but the resident is going to save money over the long term. I will tell you that in Belchertown, we see very few new homes built with oil for a couple of reasons, one of which propane is easier to reach these scores because you get a high efficiency propane. And with the high efficiency propane heaters, you don't need a masonry chimney. <clears throat> you just vent them right outside. So they're saving money, not just that, they're saving money on the insulation of that process. So if we go a little bit further. I'm going, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. I'm going to believe you. 
I think we're, I think we're close to the end. I want to show you propane and oil because you probably have some oil bills out here already. It's a more efficient laptop, so. <laughs> maybe, oh, maybe it is energy efficient. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to shut up for a while. Yeah. <laughs> now, the next couple of slides are just about commercials, energy code, which I don't think we have a lot of. Yeah, so we can slide down there. That was the next slide. Yep. We're, yeah, so we talked about that. So there, there is a commercial stretch code that, it, that is uh, probably in, not appropriate here. You don't have a lot of commercial buildings over 100,000 square feet being built. Okay, so we go next slide. But we're held. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're glad to have. It. So again, here's the map. And, and again, in the beginning, you know, a lot of people said, you know, especially out where I live, a lot of, a lot of uh, skeptics. He said, you know what? We're just going to wait. One of my concerns as a second was. You know, as, as you all know, when you're doing your budget, you're thinking about new growth, and can I add that to my, my baseline? And you don't want to lose new growth to the neighboring town. So if we do the stretch code and they don't, will the builders go there instead? Turns out that didn't work, didn't, didn't happen. And it turns out that almost everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. So there's 260 of the stretch code already. Um, the summary is the stretch code is no longer much of a stretch because the base code caught up to it. Not that the stretch code got easier, the standard code got more energy efficient. Um, you do need a Hertz Raider's involvement for more of the project, but the base code requires one also. The extra cost for the extra involvement is not completely offset by the mass save residential construction, but close. And additions, renovations, and repairs are exempt. I think the last slide is we're done. Yeah, that's me. Oh, oh. done that before? I've done this before. Yes, sir. Uh, no, that was great. I mean, very, uh, very informational. So I guess the next process, the next part of the process for us, um, relative to the stretch code, is what. So apparently, it's on your town meeting. Yep. Mark, um, Kelly Brown said she'll be at the town meeting in case people have questions, because often they, they do. Yep. Um, it's not unusual for people to, to have heard of it in the past and heard horror stories, and, and those may very well come up at town meeting. So it's useful to have someone say. Yeah, yeah that, that used to be uh, pretty scary, but it's no longer as scary. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, your helper is going to help you with criteria, the other criteria. MRPC. MRPC, yeah. So we're going to help you with the, uh, the other four criteria. And in October, hopefully you get all your paperwork into us. And um, that happens in October. In December, we review all the applications that come in, and we make a big grand announcement. Here's the 20 new ones or 30 new green communities. and hoop to do and um, the following year, you're going to start tell us how you like to spend that money on energy projects. So one of the five criteria, criteria number three is, you're going to look at all the energy you use in your town buildings, electricity, heating oil, you're going to look at street lights and traffic lights. I know there was a ton of traffic lights out here. I don't know how I got some towns. <laughs> and a couple of municipal lights. Um, uh, vehicles. So we're going to add up all the energy that you use in a calendar, in a fiscal year, and we come up with a plan to reduce that by 20%, which is not trivial, but again, you're going to get some help with it because the utilities will come and do an energy audit of all your buildings. Just like you can get a no cost energy audit of your home, I hope you've all done it. You're allowed to do it every couple of years. It's well worth your effort. They do it for buildings, useful buildings, commercial buildings, and they will help you create the list of things you could do to save energy. Things like LED lights, heating, um, insulation. And one of my towns, we did uh, new garage doors in the DPW because even though you shut them, the wind and heat was just going out. So we put in, we put in new garage doors in the DPW, um, insulation in the firehouse. So there's lots of things that people who know more than I do can walk through your building and start giving you the list of things to do to save energy. That becomes part of the submittal to become a green community. And often, when people get the grant, they start using the money on that list that they've created that hopefully is in some sort of a priority order. When you make that list, you're not stuck to it forever. It's not carved in concrete. Things change over time. You might think about, well, we're going to repair this old building, and now we decide, no, we're just going to get rid of it and start over. That's OK. But what we're looking for is that you understand how much energy you use, and you have a plan for reducing it where possible. Just to quickly supplement, yeah. uh, Jim, so we, we have progressed in uh, many of the other criteria, we have done the energy audit 
Uh, we are doing the energy plan. We've included the schools, which we think would be important for capital upgrades there, especially at the center school. We've combined with Barry to include the middle school and the high school Great. to uh, to share some projects down the road when we complete all the projects we need here. Also spoke with the building inspector in Gardner. Um, he uh, believes very similar to this presentation that that the average resident would not know the difference between the current building code and the stretch code and is in full support of this. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. I mean, it was so different the last time I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understood. And it's not anything we did great. It was because the standard building code evolved. Yeah, yeah, we, I, guess so. I, 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 don't, I don't want to say we, we responded to complaints. We did. Yeah. <laughs> well, any else? Oh, uh, I just yeah, want to say one more thing. Someone might very well ask, yeah, well, so what if they make the stretch code a bigger stretch in the future? Are we stuck forever? And the answer is no. Okay. You can unadapt it the same way you adapt it. So every time they make a change in the building code, there's like a six month lag window, even when they announce it, when it takes effect, so that builders can figure out how to do it and or pull the building permits before it occurs. Um, and if you decide that the, uh, there's a new building code that comes up that's really bizarro and you don't want to be involved, you can just unadopt it. We don't show up and take the insulation out of the garage. We don't come in and take those LED lights back. It's just that you would not be eligible for future grants. Sure. So there's always a way out. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Anything else for Jim, anybody? Well, thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. No problem. All right, moving on. Um, Welcome good. to stay for the rest. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, thank you so much. We've got the, uh, yeah. the ATM warrant. Um, what would you like to tell us about that? I know you gave us an update a little earlier today. I did. So in um, our conversations with uh, Templeton, as you know, we have an agenda item later to discuss accounting services, but they have begun to look at our accounts, which is just a good exercise in terms of cleaning up old stuff. So one thing they did find Thank you. Is that uh, we are not in compliance with uh, Department of Revenue regulation that kicks in on July 1, so the new fiscal year, to have our PEG access, which is the cable committee's fund, not be a revolving fund. It needs to be either a special revenue account or an enterprise account. So we've worked, and this was, a, this was identified a week ago, uh, discussed today, and we finalized everything at 11 today, which is why you're getting it right now, which is why it was added to the agenda, because we knew we had to sign this one. So, in summary, we do need to address this account. If we don't take it from a revolving account to a special revenue account, which we're recommending, or an enterprise fund, then um, all the money would be then put into our general fund and certified as free cash, and the cable committee would lose the funding they get. Um, which is not what we want, since their, their money is their, their money. Not their, it is their money. So I met with the cable committee today, luckily they were meeting today. They are in support of, uh, in this warrant, I'll scroll down so you can see it. it's also in the packet, adding articles 32 and 33. So if you were in support of this tonight, you'd have to open the warrant, discuss these, add them, recommend them or not, and then close the warrant. But these two that would be under consideration would be establishing a special revenue account called the PEG Access and Cable Related Fund. So this would take in the cable franchise fees that are negotiated with the cable companies, no um, additional taxes or any increase to our, to our residents except for what fees they pay for their cable providing. And it would create this account, it would take all the money from the revolving fund that exists now and put it into this special revenue account. and then. Annually, and this is why the state wants this to be done this way, town meeting has to appropriate those funds based off a recommendation from the cable from the cable committee. So essentially it's creating a budget outside of the budget <coughs> and making it more transparent. Uh, so still within article whatever it is, uh, seven, we have the PEG access $25,000 fiscal year 2020 spending limit. That stays there though? So we would... Um, in a motion, rescind that that uh, revolving fund. Or next year, since we don't use it anymore, we would get rid of it. Okay. So we can't assume that this would pass, so we would go back and either amend it or do it at a future time. Okay. Okay, so we need a motion to open the warrant. Yeah, so Article 32 is <clears throat> establishing that special revenue fund, and Article 33 would be funding it. And then every year you get some version of Article 33, which is saying 
we're going to appropriate X amount of money to be spent on from the cable committees. So we're basically just opening up the warrant to insert yeah. these two yeah. articles, right? To yeah. approve the updated warrant. So to insert them, to put them on the warrant, then you can decide whether or not to recommend them and then close them. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to open the warrant to discuss and possibly add <coughs> Article 32 and 33. I'll second the motion. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Uh, now we need a motion to uh, insert articles 32 and 33 into the uh, warrant. I'll make a motion to insert articles 32 and 33 into the current warrant. I'll second that. And just in discussion, should we say insert and approve? Uh, you can recommend if you want. Okay. And recommend. All right. Want me to amend my motion? Yeah, you don't have to say it. <laughs> 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 and to also approve. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Okay. So now we assign a warrant. Uh, before you close it, just want to mention one more change. Just for transparency's sake. Article 25, which is the street or road. Uh, warrant article, no change was made to it except town council recommended that we include the day that it was revised. So it now reads that the layout plan of Streeter Road dated November 30, 2018, and page three revised on April 1, 2019. That is the exact copy that was given to you at the public hearing. No change is just calling out that revision date that, uh, to make sure that everyone's looking at the same plan. Okay. All right, I'll make that motion to change article 25 as to what Ryan said. Second the motion. Discussion? No favor? Yes. 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 <coughs> motion to close. Make the motion to close the warrant. Second the motion. Discussion? No favor? Yes. 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 Okay. So we need to disappear for a while and encrypt the copy. Or uh, we can do it at the end of the night. To sign me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, the only change. See this bleeded down. Yep. And then make sure these aren't going on to a second one. Okay. Just structure change. <coughs> we'll wait till the end. Okay. Yep. Uh, okay, new business. We've got the, the DLTA contract. Yeah, so this has been um, discussed many times with you. Do you have the sign election one? Yep. Right, Five, please. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was just, I didn't know if I to skip that, too. Um, That's Do we need a motion for that? Yes. Make a motion to sign the election warrant. Sign and approve the election warrant. Second the motion. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. Yes. Let's start it. Yeah, good. <coughs> That's shooting for that 645. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. They'll date it? Yeah, Joyce, Joyce will date it. Joyce will date it. You're, you're, you're in the wrong place. I'm the third. I should be above right my name. Yes. Did I just sign it below it? It's all right. I'll, I'm sign, sorry. I'll sign above you. Sorry about that. If you have another one, I can just make a copy of it. That way it's right. My bad. Sorry. No, that's okay. So, you signed wrong on it. It's not wrong on it. It's an error. It is. Sell it on eBay. I did it twice. I did it twice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so those are from the cable committee. They are going to be passed out at the open, the open uh, house. 
So they are nice. reusable bags and pens and note pads that can be carried with you for any notes. So you're wanting to make sure that you. Thank you. So this you've seen a couple times, this is the grant we received for the uh, planning board to engage MRPC for writing a master plan chapter, the one they chose with natural and historic resources. Yeah. So this is a contract that needs to be signed by the board in order to start that process. Okay. Board has a contract. Yeah, I'm going to make a motion to sign the DLTA contract. Second motion. So is it making a motion to have me or have the yes, chair Yes, it's only you. All right, I'll make the motion to have Dan and Chair sign the GLT. Second motion. Any contract. <clears throat> Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 And the, the policy decisions? Decisions. So our... Uh, <clears throat> Soon to retire town clerk, um, just to be thorough, we did pass a new policies and procedures guide and a new, uh, a new policy set of policies and a new procedures guide. So the board does have a uh, policies handling uh, debt and policies handling department turnovers that are on file. So we just like to rescind those policies uh, now that we've adopted the new ones. Say that again, sorry. Can you? Explain what this is again. So there's two policies that the board adopted in 2006. Okay. One of them handles uh, policies on handling department receipts, department receiving and handling of town funds, turnovers, non-sufficient fund checks, okay. and then the receipt forms. So these are now included in our procedures guide. So instead of having two policies on file, it's cleaner if we rescind this policy. I'll this make, policy set. Make a motion to rescind those policies where I just discussed. Second motion. All in favor? No discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 <coughs> the second one is the debt policies. So this is how the town is to handle debt. We did pass a new financial policy regarding debt in the fall. So this would be rescinding a former debt policy approved on February 3rd, 2006. I'll make a motion to rescind the former debt policy. Second motion. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 So in order to fix this for next time, we said that we would adopt, when we voted for them, we would adopt and rescind any of the Previous, okay. Thank you. It's a mouse. Can I say something about Thank you for water. Thank you for water. It's sure. well, <laughs> writing itself. I know, it's it. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're, we've got an old business item here, the fiscal year 2020 uh, accounting services. So in, at our last meeting I discussed with you um, our discussions with Templeton to provide regional accounting services. Um, since that time, i worked with Templeton to um, engage them in an IMA for that to happen, a three-year IMA, or what you call the contract. I also spoke with our current accounting firm. They've agreed to stay on and close FY19, which will make it very smooth, the transition. So they'll handle 2019, and as we engage with our new software and start FY20, that'll be handled by Templeton. So that should, that's going to cost a little bit of money, but it's going to smooth the transition and make sure that we're doing everything correctly, um, and that there's less stress on our limited staff in order to make that transition possible. So they've agreed to do that. Um, our auditors have agreed to do it, and Templeton has agreed to, to engage us in this IMA. Um, and as you heard me say earlier, we we're already starting to meet with um, their staff in, in case this does come to fruition to include starting to implement VADAR and telling SoftWrite that we're no longer continuing with them. So the last step is to sign the IMA, formalize the agreement. The next thing that would come to you is the contract that we're vetting right now with Council for VADAR software. Um, Templeton, Sport of Selectmen, and Finance Committee have both approved this IMA. Their town meeting is 
meet tomorrow. Okay. So if this is approved tonight, we would probably police escort it to Templeton in the morning so they can get it in front of their voters at town meeting. And we would know for sure, pending our town meeting appropriation, that this agreement is now in place. Okay, great. So we have to sign it tonight? Also? Yes. Okay. And it has been signed and vetted by our council as well. I will be thinking it tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> <laughs> one, th one thing that council did <coughs> include was a provision to protect us in case there's fraud um, in Templeton, mm -hmm. so that that didn't bleed over to Harborson. So there's a clear line of delineation between the two towns, even though the, the service is shared. Mm -hmm. So they did add that, and it was a smart thing to add. Yeah. Great. Okay. Any so we need a motion. Uh, motion to approve and yeah. sign this. I'll make a motion to approve the FY20 accounting service of INA in Templeton. Second the motion. Discussion? All favor? Yes. yes. You can go crazy on any line you want. Oh, you really? Both of us have. I can wait a minute. <laughs> as soon as this is formalized, I will bring Kelly. You know, all of our positions are important, but our town account surely is, is an important position, so we'll bring Kelly in to meet mm -hmm. and we can see uh, why we're so. Excited to have her professionalism uh, continue the excellent accounting services we've had. Okay, so you're up. Town administrator report. Oh, it's, is that your packet? It is not. Okay. You get to see it now. It's live. All right. <laughs> All right, so in terms of a budget update, we've been giving you these pretty regularly. The Senate Ways and Means published their budget last week. The change in our municipal budget is very minimal, less than 5,000. Um, very small changes to the Quabbin budget as well, which was disappointing. Um, we were hoping for more revenues on the school side to assist them in their budgeting process, which in turn lowers our assessment. Um, does not look like there'll be much relief from the Senate. We have been discussing, and you will be receiving correspondence from several towns in our district about um, what they believe and think about the Quabbin budget. To include a letter from, just want to explain that letter here. This comes from North Brookfield, uh, asking us to support the Commonwealth Rural Schools Initiative, which would provide a kicker for rural towns in order to help us with student aid. Mm -hmm. um, that little bit of help is also going to be, I've received a request today from New Braintree, who's facing the same assessment increase we are. Mm -hmm. They would like to meet, they would like all the selectmen to meet and all the finance committee in one super meeting. I told them that we do that a lot, it probably wouldn't happen, but that if the board was willing to send a representative to a meeting that we set up, they wanted to talk about some of these um, some of the finance committee's recommendations in terms of longer term planning sure. for assessment and smoothing. Um, they too are facing a significant deficit that they don't think they're going to be able to support as well. So it looks like we're going to head into a um, town meeting with a, a split budget that's going to need to be decided in, in the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. And I did talk to council as well. This isn't in here, but to add it on how we present the school budget to make sure that we're legally presenting, uh, since their budget is different, recommendation is different than our budget recommendation. Uh, we are compliant the way we're sending our warrant out, and as long as the motion is clear and the schools are allowed to speak to their department recommendation budget, then we are legally following what we need to in order to make sure that everything is done correctly for town meeting. Uh, also, vetted out the process of what happens. If you want any more additional information on that? Because if say less than two thirds of the, the district towns for the budget, what happens next? Mm -hmm. Employment vacancies. Uh, we interviewed for veteran service officers in Westminster last week. Unfortunately, we did not find a candidate, but we are going to uh, find a candidate that matched what we needed. So we're going to continue to the search for that position. Um, we are also going to start interviewing for the town clerk vacancy likely next week and that should say july 1st up there not july 10th the plan is to have a new town clerk in place no no later than two weeks prior to the start of the fiscal year to provide some training with joyce i was say is joyce going to stay a little bit to break them in we're going to bring someone in early mm -hmm. to work with joyce okay. um, she's earned her retirement so we're trying not to she sure has she'll be missed 
Um, if we can bring the candidate in earlier, we will. It's an important position, and we want to invest in that person's success. Um, we would like one of the members of the board to sit in on those those interviews. will be likely three to four interviews. Uh, they'll be during the day, unless the candidates can come at night. Um, I'd be happy to do it. You know, if it's during the day, and obviously the guys are working, just let me know. So the committee would be a representative of <coughs> myself, uh, the assistant town clerk right now, which is Kelly Joyce, obviously will be involved, mm -hmm. and uh, Heather, from, uh, the town administrator from Ashburn, who used to be a city clerk and lives in town, would like to serve on that committee as well. Mm -hmm. So we should have some, some quality interviews. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. uh, final Financial management, um, our finance team, now that this warrant has been finalized, is going to create motions for town meeting to advise uh, whoever is going to serve as our moderator, because we will have a new moderator, and sort of guide that process and, and offer some recommendations. The moderator is in charge of the meeting, but we'd like to set that person up for success as well. Uh, we submitted our complete <coughs> streets application for High Street, worked with TEC on this. Uh, the project would be very similar to the sidewalk on Elm Street. The second round is very competitive, so we are not um, we are not guaranteeing that we're going to get this grant, but we are trying. So we should try and get every dollar we can. And uh, I will be attending Complete Streets 201 tomorrow for the majority of the day. Okay. So more Complete Streets action. Where is that Western Mass? Where is it? It's Western here. So Greenfield. Is that Greenfield? Yeah, that's not too good. So we headed out there. Um, Center school roof, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. It's a new agenda item, but I was on top of it, and I'm really afraid of heights, so that wasn't fun. It's mm -hmm. massive. Uh, there's pictures on Facebook, and anyone wants to see yeah, so just how scared I was. <laughs> the Memorial Day Parade, I've been liaisoning with them. Uh, the parade's going to be on the 27th, beginning at 11 a.m. That's the Monday, the 27th, followed by a ceremony on the Town Common. The um, Quab and ROTC is going to have a nice color guard. It's just a well-planned event. And, uh, hoping people will come out and honor those who sacrificed their lives for our, for us, and uh, to honor all the work that's being put into the parade. It's been moved to earlier in the day so that residents can come participate in this town event and then um, do what they're supposed to on Memorial Day, which is to honor those who, who fell and then enjoy the freedoms that, that we have in the afternoon. And then party. And then party. <laughs> And then for recognition, uh, if you haven't seen this, the, the town flags, which was uh, yeah, definitely I a recommendation from the particularly board. noticed that because I brought it up last year yes. and we didn't. Yeah, so I appreciate that. So we didn't. We wanted to make sure we didn't forget that we should do it anyway. But I knew it was a board focus. Mm -hmm. uh, so Travis and you can see him in the bucket up there. Um, put up. We lowered all of the the fair flags and the special event flags. Put new brackets up. New flags up. It was quite a thing. Uh, Katie helped. It probably took three or four hours to get down. And, I saw uh, her. And Detective Chatney uh, gave up his lunch so he could go back to that truck and make sure that everything was done safely. Um, but the, I think they look great and they're done in time for the holiday. And, um, we have a town meeting coming up. The benchmarking discussion was supposed to happen tonight, but that got moved. And um, once the Warren is finalized and the budget is finalized. I am going to focus pretty heavily on human resources, especially with all the hiring we have going on. Mm -hmm. That is all. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've got a couple of appointments. So, appointments for Brianna Whitney. So, she's already on the historical commission. They just ended up moving her from a the alternate because they had the resignation to the permanent position, so we just want to change that. Um, Kayla Larson Dupree, she is representing the Conservation Commission on the CPC. And then Bill Holman um, is on the planning board, also on the Zoning Board of Appeals, so there was concern of any conflicts serving on both of those boards. It has been reviewed and there is not a conflict, um, so we would like to serve on that. Okay. Can we do all three at once? I'll make a motion to appoint Brianna Whitney to the Historical Commission. Kayla Larson, is it the boys? The boys, I think. The boys. Yeah. To um, represent Conservation Commission, CPC, and William Holmans to ZBA. Second the motion. Discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 <coughs> and 
and some oh, wage authorization. Yep, so wage authorization, it's for Edward Gallant. He is going to be another part-time mark driver. Just, it's hard, you know, they have schedules and, and they're only part-time, so it's hard to fill them sometimes. It doesn't cost us anything to have another one, so it's just kind of good in case somebody's out. So we have him, he's already been approved, so we did have him on the agenda before, um, but he needed to go to Mart and get certified, so we waited until he did that for the wage authorization. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the wage authorization of uh, Edward Gallant. Did we have to waive anything on that one? No, with no time from there, right? Just, just a notification. Okay, second the motion. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. <coughs> uh, committee updates the QEMP task force. I don't have any updates. We haven't scheduled our next meeting yet, or actually, we may have. I just have to, to check. We're going to be meeting quarterly. Uh, and then the town center committee, we have a meeting next Thursday. We're going to have it this Thursday, but we're going to have a quorum, so we're going to push the next Thursday. And that's where we're going to have our first uh, chance. I think I mentioned to you guys that we finally got comments uh, regarding landscaping and actual guts of the actual town center future. And mm -hmm. so uh, everyone's had a chance to sort of review them and comment. And so we're going to meet next Thursday and go over some of those details and just get general updates, reorganize, all that sort of stuff. So that's the update there. Um, Matters not reasonably anticipated by the chair. We've got, uh, uh, why don't you, can, can you go opposite order there? You want to do the PEG access ATM warrant article and then the Hubbard Center School? So we did that one already. So that's done? part of the warrant. So that's done. Okay. Uh, so, okay, Hubbard Center School group, you said you were going to get to it? Yeah, so the Center School group, the, I went up and toured it last week at the MSBA, and to, just to be candid, they've gone much faster than we expected in terms of uh, asking us to submit what we need and, and their timeline is, is really quick. So what they've said is, first of all, we need to repair the roof at some point. It's identified in the capital plan. It's 29 years old. It's leaking in several spots. Uh, it does need repair. So went up with the MSBA and toured it. They viewed it as part of their process. They're expecting somewhere between 80 and 100 applicants for about 50 projects this year to include our roof and a couple of roofs in the district. Um, you cannot submit a roof project until it's 27 years old, so we cleared that <coughs> And um, so they are allowing us to submit our application to go into the MSBA. I know you know this, but just to, to speak to the community, the MSBA, the Mass School Building Authority, provides reimbursement for these types of projects. So if you're accepted into their program, you get, um, and this number was certified today, Hoverson would get 59% reimbursement rate on the project. So. Let's say the roof was, I don't like to use numbers, but it's going to be somewhere around a million dollars. Then the state would cover 60% of that cost, and then the town would have to spend the rest. So it's definitely a program worth doing. Um, this needs to be submitted to them by June 26th. And what they need is the town's commitment that they will hold a special town meeting within 60 days of that, so by August 26th, and appropriate the funding for a feasibility study. So if it is a million dollar project, on the entirety of the project. It sounds like a lot for a feasibility study for a roof. I'm giving high what I think is high numbers. Okay. It could come in anywhere thirty two hundred, somewhere in there. Well, I don't think we're just looking ahead and saying about this. Yeah, um, it's not going to get any better, right? So might as well start the process and see where the town wants to go with it. So I, I asked, in every way, can we extend this? Because an August town meeting is not ideal. Yeah. Um, it, it may time with other things we need to do in August. Um, I will also inform you guys know that I will be in my annual training in August in Tajikistan, so I will not be available then. Um, it's a long flight of it. Yeah, it's two days. <coughs> two days and they only land and take off every four days, so it's going to be a little hairy. But Where is this? Tajikistan. Oh my gosh. Wow. I can't tell you why. It's <laughs> so the um, point here is that it can't be any more than 60 days. They may not accept us into the program, which would make this move and we go until next year, because we, we wouldn't do this without MSPA support. But if they do accept us on June 26th, and we'll know that day, um, then they're saying they won't even consider us unless we say that we'll have the time to fund the feasibility 
Does it not look good if we say, hey, we'll, we'll come back again next year? We're not ready for this yet? It does not look good. You get more points for trying. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we need to do? Um, but that doesn't, so you're saying that you'll hold the vote. So the obviously town meeting appropriates funding, so you cannot tell them that town meeting will say, yes, we're going to fund it. Course. So you're just saying that you'll hold the vote and you have the funds. Say, or the feasibility study. Um, we don't need to identify the source, but it would likely come from free cash. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have reserved about 75000 if everything goes the way um, it's been recommended at town meeting that could cover that unexpected cost um, for stabilizations in another, another place or other funds. That we have. So I don't know how much you know about this, but a lot of... Um, a lot of the schools in the district were built around the same time, time frame. Do you know? I don't really know what's going on as far as the capital plans for all the other elementary schools. Do you have any? Have you had any conversations with any of the other? So pulling it off the top of my head, yeah, two schools are also two other schools. I can't remember the exact. Yeah, fine, fine. Are also applying for their roots. I know all five need to be done. Okay. Your brain shoes was done with windows, so there's four left. They all need to be done. They're all trying the same route. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to be one of the first, depending on if everybody else applies as well. But you're right, they were all built at the same time, and they're all up. So we deserve that. Right. So on their current capital plan, they did say that they were going to look at MSBA funding this year. They did not anticipate that they would get it. But this obviously sped up that timeline. They were surprised as well. And there's no help from the district on this sort of budget. Not for the center school, no. It's 100% on the top. Unless it's not as much of us or something. Yeah. <coughs> so, so, um, okay. All right. Let's, let's leave the update there. Um, so if, if you did want to do that, we need to send them a certified vote saying that you will hold special time meeting by August 26 and fund the feasibility study. And put it on the warrant that you will fund the feasibility study. Okay. Um, and when you say it's certified vote, that means a certified vote from us? From the board, we would say that you voted. The Boston School would put their cover letter on it, and that would be part of the MSBA symbol. I don't know what you guys think. It's, yeah. So we're we'll we'll basically we're voting that we would have another town meeting then, right? Yeah, which we may be able to do some other business at, right? So earlier than we'd want, but we would be able to do other things. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, and if it's going to give us the possibility of the most amount of money contributed yeah. to us, then it's like, I don't know, we have to do it, yeah, sure. Just, the, there will need to be a roof replacement. Does it need to be one of months from now? No, but it's going to have to happen the next. It's on the five-year plan, we expect it in the next five years. And I think I'd rather know, because that would be part of the feasibility study, is what sort of condition it's in, rather, rather know whether we do have a few more years or whether or not it's, you know, there's 37 5 gallon buckets on the ground inside collecting leaking water. What type of options? There's three different types of roof up there right now. So how, like, do you, how do you want it yeah, worded? Slate. <laughs> how do you want the motion worded? Are in favor of going ahead with the feasibility study? Or? That you will agree to hold a special yeah. town meeting by August 26 mm -hmm. and place on the town meeting warrant an article to fund the feasibility study for the Harvest and Center School. Yes. So more. <laughs> Good? Yes. Okay, so that was, a, that was his motion? I'll uh, second it. Okay, any discussion? <laughs> Anything else we need to talk about on that before we <coughs> certify the vote? No, I mean, I have more information if everyone needs it. No, no, okay. All right, um, all in favor? Yes. yes. Yes, okay. So you'll draft a. Yeah, tomorrow we'll send it mm -hmm. to the squad and, and then they'll, they'll submit it. And we will know. They make a big deal out of it on June 26th. Good. Okay, so we're at public press question and answer. Chris, you got anything? <laughs> Not tonight. Uh, we still need to sign the warrant. Do we have to do that before we adjourn, or can we do that after we adjourn? You voted to sign it, so we can sign it after. Okay. Move to adjourn? I'll second that. Okay, discussion. <laughs> 7.59, Bruins, one minute. All in favor? Yes. Yes. yes.